Blue Origin announced on May 5 that it would fly people on its new Shepard suborbital vehicle for the first time on July 20. The company did not disclose who would fly on the vehicle, which is capable of carrying up to six passengers. According to Blue Origin, they will make one seat available to the public via an auction. The company will accept sealed bids through May 19, then go into an unsealed bidding phase, concluding in a live auction on June 12. Blue Origin said that the winning bid amount will be donated to Blue Origin's foundation, Club for the Future, to inspire future generations to pursue careers in STEM and help invent the future of life in space. New Shepard has successfully flown 15 tests since its first launch in 2015, but has never flown with a crew on board. New Shepard consists of a rocket and a capsule, both of which are reusable. The launch vehicle is designed to take both people and payloads on an 11-minute journey to space. The July 20 flight will launch from Blue Origin's flight test facility near Van Horn, Texas. After a three-minute powered flight, the capsule separates near space at about 67 kilometers and continues to space to reach an apogee of 106 kilometers. The launch vehicle is entirely autonomous, every person on board is a passenger, and there are no pilots. After separating from the capsule, the booster autonomously makes its way back down to Earth for a pinpoint landing on the landing pad about 3.2 kilometers away from where the vehicle lifted off. Meanwhile, the capsule gives astronauts on board over three minutes of weightlessness and an out-of-this-world view through its large windows. The capsule then enters a stable free fall back to Earth, deploying a set of three parachutes to slow its return in the desert of Van Horn. Small rocket motors at the base of the capsule fire for milliseconds before landing to soften the impact of touchdown. The New Shepard capsule features a launch abort system, a powerful rocket motor designed to propel the craft safely away from a malfunctioning booster. The abort system has been tested three times, once at ground level and twice during ascent. Those who fly in New Shepard have to meet several physical conditions. The passengers must be at least 18 years old, weighing between 50 and 101 kilograms, being between 152 to 193 centimeters tall and able to withstand 3 Gs of acceleration during launch and 5.5 Gs for a few seconds during re-entry. Blue Origin's first crewed flight will be the culmination of over a decade of rocket testing, which has been set back by delays. The SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico on May 2, returning four astronauts from a five-and-a-half-month stay on the International Space Station. The spacecraft, dubbed Resilience, which was launched on November 15 last year, undocked from the station at 8.35 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on May 1. On board the spacecraft were NASA astronauts Mike Hopkins, Victor Glover, and Shannon Walker, and Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Soichi Noguchi. After departing the vicinity of the station, the spacecraft performed a 16-minute deorbit burn to return to Earth. After a six-hour journey, on May 2, the crew splashed down off the coast of Florida. This marked the first nighttime splashdown of a crewed U.S. spacecraft since December 1968, when Apollo 8 splashed down in the Pacific Ocean. A pair of first responding fast boats raced toward the space capsule moments after it splashed down to ensure Crew Dragon's parachutes detached upon hitting the water as planned, so they don't yank the capsule upside down in the water. A SpaceX recovery ship arrived shortly after to hoist Crew Dragon on a platform using a crane. Soon after, the astronauts boarded helicopters to Houston, and Resilience is currently in transit to a Cape Canaveral processing facility for inspection and processing. A SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket successfully launched the 25th Starlink mission on Tuesday. The rocket lifted off from Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A on May 4, carrying a full stack of 60 Starlink satellites. The launch marked the 100th straight successful Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy mission without an in-flight failure. Approximately two and a half minutes after liftoff, the rocket's first stage separated from the second stage and began its journey towards Earth. Six minutes later, the booster touched down on SpaceX's drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean, completing its ninth flight. SpaceX had previously suggested Falcon 9 boosters could fly up to 10 times, but more recently indicated those stages could have longer lifetimes. With Tuesday's launch success, SpaceX has launched nearly 1,600 Starlink satellites into orbit, including some that are no longer operational. This goes beyond the company's initial quota, which means we could see an official commercial rollout of the Starlink Internet service sometime this year. 
The next Starlink mission, scheduled for no earlier than May 9, is expected to use Booster B1051 that has flown nine times before. The Sunday flight will make Falcon 9 the first reusable liquid rocket booster of any kind to complete 10 orbital launches. The 22,000 kg core stage of a Long March 5B booster crashed back to Earth on May 9 as people around the world watched for signs of the fiery reentry event in the skies. The heavy lift Long March 5B rocket stage took off from the Wenchang spaceport on April 28 with the Tian Core module for the Chinese space station. The launcher shed its force strap on boosters about three minutes into the mission and continued its flight. Most rockets have an upper stage to finish the job of deploying payloads into orbit. And on those launchers, the first stage does not attain enough velocity to orbit the Earth and is separated from the second stage during flight. But the two powerful YF-77 engines on the rocket's core stage continued firing for about eight minutes, doing all the work to place the 16.6-meter Tian Space Station module into orbit. Many launch operators designed their upper stages to reignite their engines at the end of their missions to guide the rockets to a controlled re-entry over a remote stretch of ocean. Rather than designing the huge Long March 5B core stage to remove itself from orbit using engines or thrusters, Chinese engineers left the rocket in space after finishing its mission. The orbit of the core stage, traveling at 7.8 km per second and orbiting once every 90 minutes between 41.5 degrees north and 41.5 degrees south latitude, began to decay due to atmospheric drag. While most of the stage was expected to burn up upon re-entry, components made of heat-resistant materials, such as tanks and thrusters made of stainless steel or titanium, were predicted to reach the ground. After orbiting around the Earth for 11 days, traveling at about 28,000 km per hour, the remnants from the 33-meter-long 5-meter wide empty core stage of the Long March 5B rocket entered into Earth's upper atmosphere and fell into the Indian Ocean at 2.24 a.m. GMT. The crash site was close to the islands of Maldives, at longitude 72.47 degrees east and latitude 2.65 degrees north. There were no reports of injuries or damage. In an official statement, NASA slammed China on Sunday for failing to meet responsible standards regarding its space debris. This was not an isolated incident. The same thing happened in September of last year with a Long March 4B core stage, which narrowly missed a school at Shaanxi province in China when it fell back to Earth. The Mars helicopter Ingenuity made its fifth Martian flight on May 7, lifting off from the floor of Juzero Crater at 3.26 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The 1.8 kg chopper climbed to an altitude of 5 meters and cruised south for 129 meters, following the same path it took last week on flight number 4. During its fourth flight on April 30, Ingenuity climbed to an altitude of 5 meters before flying south approximately 133 meters and then back for a 266 meters round trip. But unlike the previous flights, Friday's trip was one way. After reaching its destination, Ingenuity climbed to 10 meters, twice as high in the Martian sky as it had ever gotten, snapped some photos, and then landed in a new place wrapping up a 108-second flight and embarking on a new journey of exploration. Ingenuity's flight campaign, which is designed to demonstrate that aerial exploration is possible on Mars, began on April 3 when the solar-powered helicopter deployed from the Perseverance's belly. The campaign was supposed to end after 30 days and a maximum of five flights. But Ingenuity performed so well and remained so healthy that NASA recently extended its mission. With the success of its third flight on April 25, NASA has decided to extend the helicopter mission an additional 30 souls and shift it into an operations demonstration phase that will test the additional capabilities of the craft. Ingenuity's transition from conducting a technology demonstration to an operations demonstration begins by mid-May with the helicopter's sixth flight. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. For the first time ever, SpaceX has successfully landed a Starship prototype in one piece on May 5. The experimental test vehicle, Starship Serial No. 15, successfully launched from SpaceX's Boca Chica launch facility in South Texas on Wednesday. The launch came a week after the company secured a rare triple Federal Aviation Administration approval for three Starship flights. While SN-15 wasn't launched in fog like SN-11 in late March, the conditions were still overcast for those viewing in the South Texas area. 
Similar to previous high-altitude flight tests of Starship, SN-15 was powered through ascent by three Raptor engines, each shutting down in sequence prior to the vehicle reaching an apogee of 10 kilometers. The vehicle performed a propellant transition to the internal header tanks before reorienting itself for re-entry and a controlled aerodynamic descent. The Starship prototype descended under active aerodynamic control, accomplished by independent movement of two forward and two aft flaps on the vehicle. During the final moments of flight, two of the three Raptor engines reignited as the vehicle performed the landing maneuver, immediately before touching down for a nominal landing on the pad. The whole flight from launch to landing lasted just over six minutes, and this time the vehicle remained intact, marking the first 100% success of a 10-kilometer Starship suborbital test flight. There was some minor concern after Starship SN-15 landed, when a small fire from the residual propellant began spreading underneath the vehicle, something that also happened during serial number 10's landing. The thermal insulation blanket inside the engine bay that caught fire during the landing burn might have initiated this fire. However, SpaceX was able to extinguish the flames and safe the test article. Safing a liquid fuel rocket is a fairly novel task involving detanking, inspecting plumbing and Raptor engines, deactivating explosive flight termination system charges, and more generally verifying the health and status of all systems. The thermal protection tiles on SN15 look intact after the flight, with just one of those 1000 tiles missing from the vehicle. The next day after the test flight, SpaceX moved two giant cranes to the launch site to initiate SN15's recovery operations. As of May 8, the landing legs of SN15 are removed, and the vehicle is being moved to the center of the landing pad with the help of a self-propelled modular transporter. According to SpaceX CEO Elon Musk, SpaceX might try to refly SN15, but he didn't mention when will that happen. The landing burn of SN15 occurred at a slightly higher altitude than the previous prototypes, resulting in a much lower descending velocity and a smooth touchdown. Unlike serial number 10, whose legs crushed during landing, all the six landing legs of SN15 survived the impact. According to SpaceX, this flight included multiple upgrades and improvements to address the findings from the rapid unscheduled disassembly that they experienced on the last flight. This flight includes multiple upgrades and improvements to address the findings from the rapid unplanned disassembly we experienced on the last flight. This vehicle also incorporates changes that get us closer to the orbital configuration plan for flight later. Soon after the landing, Elon Musk tweeted that Starship landing was nominal. He added that these kinds of iterative Starship development are the only way to create rapidly and fully reusable orbital rockets which is the fundamental technology or evolution needed to make life multi-planetary. Musk has previously mentioned that the goal is to achieve an orbital Starship flight by July of this year and is confident about an uncrewed flight to Mars by 2024. Moving on to other Starship updates, Starship serial number 16, which is currently standing inside the high bay, got its aft flaps installed last week. Actuated by an onboard flight computer, forward and aft flaps control Starship's attitude during flight and enable precise landing at the intended location. Recently SpaceX employees unhooked SN16 from the bridge crane, hinting that the prototype is now ready to be rolled out. The rollout could happen this week, and as per various sources, SpaceX is targeting no earlier than two weeks for the launch of SN16. Work on cryogenic insulation shells for the ground support equipment tanks installed at the launch site is in progress. GSE tanks hold cryogenic liquid propellants to support orbital Starship flights. These insulating shells provide thermal insulation between the interior and exterior, reducing the rate at which the contents inside the tank boils away. The shells must be able to safely manage the gas released as the propellant slowly boils. They must allow the gas to escape through some kind of valves to prevent the risk of an explosion. Construction of orbital launch tower segments is in progress at the build site. Two segments have already been completed, and work on the third segment has begun. These segments will be placed one on top of the other to complete the 140-meter orbital launch tower. The launch tower is capable of Starship stacking and mid-air super heavy catch. A nose cone and a nose cone barrel section with a complete set of heat shield tiles installed on its surface were spotted at the build site last week. These could be the nose cone sections of serial number 17. Eight new composite overwrapped pressure vessels were delivered to the build site last week. 
they hold super cold helium under high pressure to pressurize the propellant tanks. Now, let's take a look at the current status of various Starship prototypes, with the help of this illustration from Brendan Lewis. The oxygen tank midsection and aft dome skirt of Starship serial number 20 and two four-ring stainless steel tank section of booster BN3 were spotted at the build site last week. Watch our previous videos on the playlist to get updates on other Starship prototypes. Link in the description. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.